Mary's Ghost by Thomas Hood, 1799-1845 T'was in the middle of the night to sleep young William tried, when Mary's ghost came stealing in and stood at his bedside. Oh, William, dear, oh, William, dear, my rest eternal ceases. Alas, my everlasting peace is broken into pieces. I thought the last of all my cares would end with my last minute. But though I went to my long home, I didn't stay long in it. The body snatchers, they have come and made a snatch at me. It's very hard, them kind of men won't let a body be. You thought that I was buried deep, quite decent like in Charry. But from her grave and merry bone, they've come and boned your merry. The arm that used to take your arm is took to Dr Vise. And both my legs are gone to walk the hospital at Guy's. I vowed that you should have my hand, but fate gives us denial. You'll find it there at Dr. Bell's in spirits and a file. As for my feet, the little feet you used to call so pretty, there's one I know in Bedford Row, the t'other's in the city. I can't tell where my head has gone, but Dr. Carpew can. As for my trunk, it's all packed up to go by Pickford's van. I wish you'd go to Mr. P and save me such a ride. I don't half like the outside place they've took for my inside. The cock at crows, I must be gone. My William, we must part. But I'll be yours in death, although Sir Astley has my heart. Don't go to weep upon my grave and think that there I be. They haven't left an atom there of my anatomy. Hello, I'm David Hume. You're very welcome to join me. We're going to be looking in this presentation at the body snatchers, the resurrection men, or the grave robbers. You can pick whichever title you prefer. We're going back in time to quite an unbelievable time when graves were being robbed, cemeteries were being guarded, and a trail led from places like Belfast and County Antrim across to Edinburgh, where there was a need for cadavers in the medical schools. These are photographs taken at Rashid Cemetery near Ballyclare. I went to that old cemetery to record a programme for BBC Radio Ulster called The Graveyard Shift a few years ago. I found being inside the Mort House, where coffins were guarded to protect bodies being stolen by the resurrection men, very eerie indeed. So I don't really want to imagine what it would have been like to have stayed there at night with the coffin guarding against the resurrection men. What a macabre situation it was and how did it all come about? Well, before the Anatomy Act of 1832, the only legal supply of corpses for anatomical purposes in the UK were of those who were condemned to death and dissection by the courts. And they were often guilty of uh, comparatively harsh crimes, uh, but the truth was there were not enough cadavers or bodies to fulfill the needs of the medical schools. So in order to meet those needs, other cadavers had to be found. And a very curious industry grew up whereby the medical schools were paying for the arrival of bodies without asking too many questions. Now, the delivery of these corpses, of course, created a very unusual situation and one in which no deceased body was safe, particularly in isolated rural areas like that at Rashid that we've seen the uh, photographs of the Mort House, but also in cities as well. Clifton Street in Belfast uh, hired a watchman or watchmen to look after the cemetery at night because of the danger of newly deceased bodies being disinterred by the grave robbers. And the whole um, situation from a legal point of view was that interfering with a grave was a misdemeanor in common law and it carried uh, penalties uh, such as fines or imprisonment. 
but it did not carry transportation or execution as a penalty. So therefore, given the fact that between £10 and £14 on average was being paid in the 1820s for cadavers in the medical schools, it became quite a lucrative business, even though it was extremely grisly in terms of extraction uh, of the bodies themselves. And how did that happen? Well, uh, one method the body snatchers would have used was to dig at the head end of a, a recent uh, burial. They would dig with a wooden spade uh, because it was quieter than metal, wouldn't make much sound uh, at night, which is when the grave robbing occurred. When they reached the coffin, they would break open the lid. Uh, they would put a rope around the corpse, usually the head of the corpse, and they would then drag the corpse uh, up through the area that they had dug. So it wasn't a matter of the whole grave being reopened. Uh, it was uh, quite technical in terms of how they extracted the bodies. And we do have an account um, from a man called Sir Robert Christian. He gave a very detailed uh, contemporary account of the operations of the body snatchers at that particular time. And he said the time uh, chosen in the dark winter nights was for the town churchyards from six to eight o'clock, at which later hour the churchyard watch was set. And the city police also commenced their night rounds. A hole was dug down to the coffin only where the head lay, a canvas sheet being stretched around to receive the earth and to prevent any of it spoiling the smooth uniformity of the grass. The digging was done with short, flat, dagger-shaped implements of wood to avoid the clicking noise of iron striking stones. On reaching the coffin, two broad iron hooks under the lid, pulled forcibly up with a rope, broke off a sufficient portion of the lid to allow the body to be dragged out and sacking was heaped over the hole to deaden the sound of the cracking wood. The whole process could be completed in an hour, even though the grave might be six foot deep. Because the soil was loose and the digging was done impetuously by frequent relays of active men, transference over the churchyard wall was easy in a dark evening and once in the street the carrier of the sack drew no attention at so early an hour. So that was the essential mechanism um, of this horrific and gruesome industry. And the market were the medical schools in the context of, of um, Antrim and Down. Edinburgh was the nearest medical school and uh, all efforts were made to uh, get bodies across the narrow sea to Scotland. There are a number of accounts of um, barrels being uh, stopped in the docks, being searched, um, and bodies found to be inside the barrels. Uh, and they were dispatched in either barrels or trunks across to addresses uh, in Scotland. Most historians would agree that uh, we do know about the uh, incidents where uh, bodies were retrieved and where people went to uh, court uh, for these felonies. But they would also agree that we really have no idea how many uh, bodies fell prey to the grave robbers uh, during this time. So quite an amazing situation and a totally macabre situation to imagine at that particular time. So what efforts were made to try and counter the grave robbers? Mort safes were used, iron devices that enclosed coffins, but more uh, commonly railings were used around some grave sites, such as this one at Rishi, sort of a birdcage affair. Also large slabs were placed on top of the newly dug grave, and in time they would have become a little more elaborate. We can see some examples here of the slabs, and then a more elaborate uh, built up affair here, this one in Bangor Abbey in County Down. But also, uh, people were hired to be watchmen, as at Shankill Cemetery and Clifton Street Cemetery in Belfast. And this is the old musket that was used by the watchman at Clifton Street. And we know something of the efforts that were made from old accounts in 
uh, newspapers. This is from the Belfast newsletter uh, in 1831, December the 2nd, 1831. And it relates to uh, Mollusk uh, Graveyard, which is just outside Belfast. And uh, an article in the paper um, says, about the beginning of 1829, a few individuals in Carn Money, shocked at the frequent violations of the sanctuary of the dead, called a meeting of proprietors of burying ground in the above graveyard to devise, if possible, some means of protecting the peaceful grave from the sacrilegious spoliation of the most heartless of all plunderers, the body snatchers. After many proposals, a committee was chosen and the business entrusted to their care. A small piece of ground immediately adjoining the graveyard was purchased by them on which a neat and convenient cottage was erected for the accommodation of a caretaker whose duty it is to dress the fences, shear the nettles and weeds, and clear out useless stones, etc. An upper room with windows commanding a view of all the burying grounds is reserved for the watchmen, who will be greatly assisted by a movable lamp which the committee intend to set up. So a lot of efforts going on in Molusk to try and prevent uh, body snatching and grave robbing going on. And we do know some of the incidents that occurred also from um, old newspapers. The Belfast Newsletter, February 15th, 1828, reporting a serious altercation at the new burying ground in the city at Clifton Street when five men were disturbed, seeking to exhume the body uh, of a, a late surgeon, Bailey, who had been interred there. S sentinels from a regiment had been placed in the cemetery and the men had run off when they were challenged. Um, but we know from the account that uh, it says, when at some distance finding themselves pursued, one of them turned round and fired a loaded gun or pistol at the soldiers. The fire was returned by them, but to no effect. The party got into the fields and were pursued down at the head of North Street. The corporal who had been on guard, having in the guard room heard the shots, understandably ran out, and on going up to the gate of the graveyard, he found a man named George Stevenson in the act of getting over the gate with a sentinel's lantern in his possession. When challenged, Stevenson said that he had been to the cemetery to visit his father's grave, but nobody really took too seriously that claim at that time of night. Uh, so he was one of the body snatchers who were apprehended in the course of their activity. And then there was a clear warning in the Belfast newsletter as well, and it gives a flavour of the uh, feelings about this situation. Um, it says this. There are at present some persons in Belfast whose occupation and accent lend us to believe that they are of that class of Scotch gentlemen who wish to illuminate the Irish students with a peep at their dead friends. We have no objection to dissection, but we have great objections to our supplying the colleges in Scotland with bodies from Ireland. If the present notice do not serve as a sufficient hint to those persons to convey their own bodies speedily home, we will so describe their persons and haunts as will make them better acquainted with the populace of Belfast than may be agreeable to their feelings. The Belfast newsletter did also point out that while everyone was against body snatching, there was a need for dissection and an understanding uh, of medicine and anatomy. It said that there was uh, some suggestion that those who died in public hospitals and whose bodies were not claimed by relatives could be used for dissection. It said that uh, in relation to this, that... Um, the science of medicine, as applied to practice, will degenerate into quackery and its practitioners will be reduced to the necessity of learning knowledge by dangerous experiments, not upon the dead, but upon the living, unless there was a supply of cadavers for medical students. So there was the essential dilemma of the whole situation. And we do know a number of uh, incidents continued uh, and right until the early 1830s, there are still accounts of uh, body snatching going on and uh, occasional court cases of some people involved in it. Um, in April 1831, for example, uh, Robert Norris appeared at London Dairy Assizes charged with exhuming and carrying away the body of a lady named Mary Thompson uh, out of the meeting house yard near Kilray on December the 29th, 1830. 
He was also charged with stealing the linen which covered Mary Thompson's body. Um, the act was fully proved by a man called William Maberly. Stealing the linen was actually more serious than stealing the body at, the, at that time in terms of the law. And stealing the linen would have been what could have led to transportation or execution. Um, it was reported that the prisoner was one of three. The other two had not been apprehended. And it was alleged that on the body being raised, Norris took the cap of the corpse and put it in his pocket, saying, Old Maul Thompson, you'll now have a free passage to Scotland. The men then put the body in the sack and carried it away. Norris was found guilty and was ordered to be transported for seven years. And we don't know what then became of him. An example of how the uh, trail of bodies from uh, Ulster to Scotland went on comes about in December 1831 when the body of a woman was discovered inside a trunk taken to a steamer bound for Scotland uh, from Belfast docks. There was a note atta attached to the trunk. It was addressed to a James McWilliams in Glasgow and uh, alluded to the fact that there were butter and hams uh, in the trunk. Uh, when the suspicion of uh, some of the people at the docks was aroused, uh, the porters began to question about the trunk. The person who uh, had appeared with it uh, took themselves off very rapidly and that of course led to the trunk being forced open and the body being discovered. The body was of a female, uh, it was unidentified and uh, it was taken to the poor house and then to the Clifton Street Cemetery where it was buried in the trunk. Grave robbing continued and not only um, in this part of the world but there are accounts from across the British Isles including one from Dublin in the Belfast newsletter of January 8th 1833 uh, detailing several incidents at St George's Church Yard in the city. Uh, a guard had been employed, as was the case in, in many other cemeteries, and um, an attempt had been made by resurrectionists to raise a body, it was reported. Circumstance was communicated to Mr Perry, the vestry clerk, and he proceeded to George's watch house and procured a guard to drive off the resurrectionists. When the guard and the clerk arrived, they called upon the grave robbers to surrender, and one was heard to say, walk away boys, I'll protect you. Jackson, the beadle, advanced towards the man upon whom he discharged a blunderbuss and Jackson was shot in the breast. The newspaper reported that this man Jackson, in falling, made a stab at a man named Dugan um, and broke one of his ribs. Dugan was then assaulted by the police party and had his leg broken and he was taken into custody. Jackson died about an hour after being shot. So this was a savage business and as far as the grave robbers were concerned uh, it was a lucrative business but if they were caught and caught in the act of stealing property then that made it even worse. So uh, it was rather better to be hanged for a sheep than a lamb in their view which is why they would have resisted arrest so desperately on some occasions such as this one. Now into this scenario come two individuals who take the whole situation over grave robbing and the resurrection men a stage further, much further. Thomas Hare and William Burke are now notorious in history. They are serial killers who provided bodies for Dr Knox's anatomical school in Edinburgh. The pair were both from the north of Ireland and they fetched up together in Edinburgh and met up there and they started their spree it is believed through the agency of a natural death a man called Donald who was lodging in William Hare's home in Edinburgh. Donald owed money uh, to Hare for the rent when he died and in order to try and recoup some of the money that was owed they decided to sell his body to the medical school. And that seems to have set a chain of events into operation whereby they realised that if they could dispatch individuals who wouldn't be terribly missed 
in Edinburgh, then they could get money, good money, for cadavers. And it was usually £10 a corpse that was being paid. Knox had no direct connection to this. It was always through a middleman or middlemen who were buying these bodies. And so whether he knew that these people had not died natural deaths, uh, given that they were being provided by the same individuals in a, in a relatively short space of time, is not known. Um, suspicion should have been aroused probably by those who were buying these bodies. Um, and eventually the authorities did become aware of the situation that a number of uh, rather dubious engagements had taken place and transactions between Burke and Hare and the medical school. Over 10 months, it's believed that Burke and Hare murdered 16 people. The last of their victims was a woman named Mary Doherty, who was also a tenant in Hare's property. Mary Doherty was friendly with a couple called the Greys, and on leaving the tenement on one occasion, they heard an altercation which they believed to involve Mary. They heard a female voice shouting murder. When they came back to the tenement, Mary was nowhere to be found. Birkin Hare professed no knowledge as to where she might be. But the Greys managed to find her. Her body was concealed under a bed in one of the rooms in the tenement. They determined to go to the police. Burke and Hare tried to bribe them and offered them money not to disclose the fact that Mary's body was there. Whenever the Greys went to go to report this, Burke and Hare very quickly disposed of Mary's body and they did so in a familiar way. When the police came back to the tenement, there was no sign of her body but in interviewing Burke and Hare, both men gave contradictory statements. The police ended up going to Dr Knox's medical school and there they found the body of Mary Doherty. From that point, the whole thing began to unravel. But it's extremely unlikely that there would have been a conviction unless one of the two men gave evidence against the other on behalf of the Crown. And it was Thomas Hare who was encouraged to provide state's evidence against William Burke. The result was that Burke was sentenced to execution and it was a very public and very noisy execution in the centre of Edinburgh. After the execution, Burke's body was sent for dissection, irony of ironies. William Hare had managed to save his life by giving evidence against Burke and he made his way back across the North Channel. A few years ago I presented the BBC Radio Ulster programme called The Graveyard Shift in which I followed the trail of Thomas Hare back into County Down and eventually to Kilkee. He lived in a very isolated cottage near the shore at the harbour and he died in Kilkeel Workhouse and was interred in the pauper cemetery there in an unmarked grave. And so the dreadful saga of Burke and Hare finally came to a close. But without Burke and Hare the Anatomy Act of 1832 would not have come about. It was their excesses that highlighted the desire of the medical schools to obtain cadavers and the fact that some, not only in Edinburgh, but also in London, were committing murder to try and meet that need. The era was recalled in a 19th century Edinburgh skipping rhyme up the close and doon the stair, but and ben we burk and hare. Burke's the butcher, hare's the thief, 
Knox the boy that buys the beef. One thing which the murders certainly did was highlight the crisis in medical education. And along with a series of cases like John Bishop's, which became known as the London Burgers, led to the subsequent passing of the Anatomy Act 1832, which expanded the legal supply of medical cadavers to eliminate the incentive for such behaviour. The Act authorised persons who had legal custody of a dead body to send it to a medical school before burial so that it might be used for the study of anatomy and the practice of surgery. If relatives could not be found, public health authorities, parish councils and board of guardians counted as legal custodians. So the Anatomy Act of 1832 brought about the end of an era and what an era it had been. A chilling time when the newly deceased were at risk of being stolen and taken away to medical schools to be dissected and not to actually rest where their families believed they had been laid to rest. A chilling time when individuals who knew that the money was lucrative enough would go out at dead of night on the information of new burials or new deaths and try and bring these bodies from the ground to raise them back up again, hence the term resurrection men. Get them on a ship to Scotland and earn perhaps 10 or 14 pounds a cadaver. I've been in the old Rishi Mort house and it was chilling enough standing there in the daylight, but I wouldn't have wanted to be part of a, a guard for a coffin uh, in the evenings until dawn broke, standing there perhaps by candlelight uh, right through the night, watching out or listening out for the sounds potentially of the resurrection men. And I'm sure there would have been many sounds that could have caused a lot of alarm in the early hours of a vigil such as that. Thankfully, the Anatomy Act brought it all to an end and it was Burke and Hare's excesses that really brought the Anatomy Act about as well. Now we look back on it as an era in history that we can read about, try to understand, but there's lots of socioeconomic factors behind it as to why people felt they had to go out and do this to raise money for themselves. There's lots of issues um, about the idea of anatomy being uh, essential for medical research and the great uh, paradox, of course, that without the bodies, then medical research would not have been furthered and medical students would not have learned. Those were the key issues, key moral issues at stake during this time, and they were pretty major issues when you think about it. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation and I hope you've found it of interest. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.